Good morning. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the cooler weather. Um, thank you for this community. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and hang out and, and talk and eat together and, and learn more about you. And I, I pray that you would bless this time, that you would bless um, our conversation right now, that you would bless our worship, um, bless our food, and give us grace um, for one another and compassionate hearts uh, to see each other. Bless this time. In your name I pray. Amen. So, we are in a series on the book of Luke. And I know it's been a couple weeks since we didn't, we didn't talk about it last week, really. Um, but we're in the series on Luke, and what we've been talking about is this idea of the revolution of the ordinary. So, essentially, what happens when the divine meets the ordinary? What happens when Jesus comes into this world and interacts with people and starts talking and having conversations with people when, when the divine meets the ordinary, everything changes. And so we've been talking about this idea of like our lives being disrupted. And this is, so okay, I want to do an exercise. Here we go. You ready? I want you to imagine for a second that you are, um, you are a first century Jewish person. And you... Uh, you go out to do your work one day, and you, you go out all day because you left early in the morning when the sun came up, and then you worked all day, and you come back into town, and all the people are sitting around um, at, the, at the gate or at the well, and you're, you're, you, there's like excited talk happening. And you find out that while you've been out all day, Jesus has come through town. Now, you know who Jesus is because he's been around for two, three years. You've heard of him. You've heard he's been doing some crazy things. He's been healing people. And you're disappointed that you didn't, that you didn't get to see him. And so you start talking to people. And you go, so what did, what did he say? Like, what, did, what did he do? And they're like, well, he, he cast out demons and he, and he healed some people. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's cool. So what did he say? Like, what, what conversations did he, say, did, did he have? Well, he's... He talked about how um, the, the light that's in us um, should, not be, should not be darkness, but that, that what flows out of us is, is, should be light and that we should clean our, what's in us. Oh, that's cool. That's great. What else did he say? Well, well, he was talking to the Pharisees, and he said, um, he said, Woe to you, Pharisees. What? He said, What? Yeah, yeah, he was talking to the Pharisees, and he, he said, uh, sorry, I was in the other, I was in my work. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. <laughs> I'm in Acts, that's the other book that Luke, Luke wrote. He said, uh, he said, woe to the Pharisees. You know, he said, he said, he told the Pharisees, uh, you Pharisees, clean, clean the outside of the cup and the dish. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. He said, what? Yeah, he called them foolish. He said, uh, he said yeah, the Pharisees, he said that the Pharisees, uh, that they, they give a tenth of their herbs, but then they neglect justice and they, they neglect the love of God. He said, what? Yeah, no, it gets better. So then, so then Jesus, like he's sitting there and he's saying these things about the Pharisees and the teachers of law were there too, you know, because they're like, they follow him around. Man, I'm really sad I missed this. Yeah, I know. So, so the teachers of the law were talking and they were like, hey, Jesus, you know, when you say these things about the Pharisees, you know, you're kind of talking about us too. And it was, it was great, man. He said, hold on, I'll get to you. Yeah, he said, uh, 
He said, woe, woe to you Pharisees because you load, you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. He said, woe to you experts of the law because, because you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. He said, what? So this is what it's like listening to Jesus in the first century. And really, this is what it's like, this is what it should be like for us when we read the words of Jesus. Um, he also said, uh, sell your possessions and give them to the poor. He also said, I have not I have come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. And he said, "Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother." Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is a hard thing. It's hard to read the words of Jesus. They're, they're convicting. They, they say things about us. And, you know, I, when I read the, teachers of, the teacher of the law one, and I was thinking about how I'm going to teach on this passage, and then he says, you hold the key to knowledge, but you hinder those who were entering in. Or he says, you load people down with burdens, and you won't help them. I, as I was reading this, I've, I've spent like two weeks in this because I had an extra week, right? Because of belonging last week. It's been heavy on me. I've thought a lot about how do we engage with the words of Jesus. For, for some of us, we've been Christians for a long time. We've read what Jesus said many times, and it just becomes familiar. It's this thing, oh yeah, sell your possessions, okay, all right. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Or it's like, oh, I, I have brought, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Well, yeah, he's talking about how like, the Holy Spirit's going to come and, like, and, and everything's going like, to get renewed and be better. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, imagine hearing that before, before Jesus was, was crucified. Imagine hearing Jesus say, I have come to bring fire on earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Imagine hearing him say to your teachers, woe to you, because you clean the outside and you do not clean the inside. The words of Jesus should disrupt us. They should cause turmoil in our lives and cause us to, to think about what we are doing and how we are living Here's the thing. So we we spent we spent a good portion of the year talking about the books of the Bible, and basically every week we said there's so much in each book it's hard to know what to talk about. But you get into the Gospels and you get into we're in Luke 11 and 12 today. These are all things he says in in, in Luke chapter 11 and chapter 12, and we really could break this down into like a 10-week sermon series on just these two chapters. There's a lot in here. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to continue what Eric talked about. And as we, as we go through this, I want you to hold on to this idea that, that the words of Jesus should disrupt you. They should, they should cause turmoil in your life. 
And we are going to talk about Luke, the passage that, that Mike read, um, Luke 12, 35. Um, so two weeks ago, Eric in Luke 10 talked about the, uh, the Good Samaritan. It's a story about a man who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Not the other way around, right? Jerusalem to Jericho. It doesn't matter. He, they're traveling on that road, and these robbers come, and then he's, he's beaten and robbed, and he's left for dead on the side of the road, and a priest comes by and crosses over to the other side of the road and continues on. And then a Levite comes by and crosses over to the other side and then moves on. And then a Samaritan who Samaritans and Jews did not interact. A Samaritan comes by and cares for the man, binds up his wounds, takes him into the town, and, and pays for someone to care for him as he recovers. And the thing that we talked about was that you don't get to choose your neighbor. You don't get to choose the person who cares for you, who serves you, and you don't get to choose the person who you, who God puts in your path to care for and serve. And so what keeps us from that? Because there's things that keep us from that. There's things that keep us from, from engaging with the people here in this room. There's things that keep us from engaging with people as we go about our lives, as we're at work. And one of the really common refrains, one of the things that, that Jesus says, that uh, Peter says in, in 1 Peter, um, and it's in a lot of different places in the Bible, but it says, it says, be ready. Luke 12, verse 35 says, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. So this idea of being dressed ready for service, this really, this, as I said, I thought a lot of, I wanted to really think about all this because of what Jesus says about the, the teachers of the law and I'm going to stand up here and I'm going to teach about this passage and, and tell you to do things. So I thought about this. It says, be dressed ready for service. Now, I really like to wear my Birkenstocks. Wearing my Birkenstocks right now. I really I love my Birkenstocks. They're comfortable and they're easy. I don't care that they came into style a couple of years ago and I started wearing them like years before that. They're not in style anymore now and I'm still wearing them. I, they might come back around, I don't know. But I don't really care about that. I like my Birkenstocks because they're comfortable. And when I want to leave the house, I can walk right up, slip them on, and walk out the door. It's easy. I don't have to think about it. I know what I'm wearing. I wear my Birkenstocks like 365 days a year. I mean, really, I really do. But here's the thing. I also wear shorts, and I like the pockets on the sides, even though I hardly ever put anything in my pockets on the sides. I really like my shorts. I wear t-shirts most days. I am not dressed ready for service in many senses of the word. Um, when I drive along and I see someone stopped on the side of the road, um, I want to get out and help them push. You know what's hard to wear while you're pushing a car? Birkenstocks. <laughs> When my friends call me and say, hey, I need to move some furniture, you know what's hard to wear? I helped, I helped Joey move this giant chest a few weeks ago, and I had to walk backwards in my Birkenstocks. And it was raining, and they were slippery. So I was thinking this week, should I just start wearing, should I stop wearing Birkenstock? Should I wear jeans every week? Should I wear a shirt, like a work shirt that I can do some work in? Um, should I get some shoes and start wearing socks and shoes uh, every day? 
Should I put my, my work gloves in my car so that I have them when I need them? Should I get jumper cables and put them in my car? I actually have jumper cables in my car. If you don't have jumper cables in your car, you should go get some jumper cables and put them in your car. It's just good practice. But also, you get to help people jump their car sometimes. What does it look like for me to be dressed ready for service? So some of it's that. Some of it's, I actually, what are, what are the barriers that we experience in actually just being ready to jump into service? To have the door knocked on and to open the door and say, yeah, I'm ready, let's go. Some of it is the actual, I, I'm still going to wear Birkenstocks. But I, I need, I got new socks this week. Because all my socks had holes in them. So there's something. But the other, there's, so there's some practical things. What does it look like for you to be ready and, and ready to serve others? But the other piece of this is it's not always like these physical, practical things. Yesterday, Eric came to the building to do something really quick. He was going to be in and out. And as he walked up, he heard water pouring in the library. He opens up the library, and there had been a leak, but now there was a river. And there's water pouring from the ceiling. And he called me, and he said, you know that leak we had? Yeah. He said, it broke. The pipe burst. I need your help. So what Eric did not need was for me to jump in my car and run over here and help him. I did do that. I had to wait for my wife to come home because my daughter was sleeping and my wife wasn't home. And I had to, I had to wait for that. But I, I eventually came over. But what Eric needed in that moment was not that. What Eric needed was for me to call a plumber to make sure that someone yesterday could come and fix the problem so that we could turn the water on for the building and be able to use the bathrooms today. That's a good thing. So I have a lot of anxiety about picking up the phone and calling people I don't know. So I picked up my phone, and I know a plumber. I like him. He's worked on my house. He's had a fair price. I think he screwed up once, but that's okay. He fixed it. I like this guy. Picked up my phone, called him, went to voicemail. Now, I can't sit around and wait for this guy to call me back, and in fact, he still hasn't. That's okay, too. But I had to keep going. Because Eric's here ripping up carpet and, and moving all the furniture, and Sue came with towels, and Elliot was here. Thank you, Elliot, for helping out. I had to make sure my job, the way that I was going to serve Eric, was to call plumbers and get someone to come. And I really did not want to. Um, I called my dad to see if he knew someone who would come. I did this all. This all happened very quickly because I knew it had to happen. But I, to get over, to get past my anxiety, I wanted, I had to do, I, I tried to do all these other things so that I would not have to face the barrier that kept me from immediately stepping into service for Eric. So I opened up Yelp, called the first guy. I was like, Jesus, Jesus, please, answer, 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 answer. And they answered, and then they said they had no one available. So I just went to the next person, <laughs> called them. They sent someone out. It's fixed. Well, I think. It's fixed. We have some other issues that we need to figure out, but it's fixed. So one of our projects for our workday is actually going to be laying new floor in the library. Yay. It's going to be fun. Be dressed, ready for service. What are the barriers that keep you from serving the people around you? Is it that you wear Birkenstocks and you're not ready to jump out of your car and push someone else's car? 
or carry a, a furniture? Is it your anxiety? Is it something else? What are the barriers that keep you from being dressed ready for service? The second thing that we have to consider is, is so be ready to serve, and then we need to cultivate a heart of service. So when you, when you, when you plant something, you have a seed. And we, we planted a garden out there, and it's really nice. You can go look at it. It's starting to sprout. When you take a seed, you put it in the ground, um, there's a depth that you put seeds at. If you put them too deep, they won't grow out. If you put them too shallow, they'll get burned up by the sun, and you have to put them at the right depth. The soil has to be right. So the soil has to be, some, some seeds need it to be looser, some seeds need it to be a little more compact, but it can't be like cement, like our soil. So we have to, you have to work on the soil outside um, to get it ready to plant. Um, it has to have certain nutrients. And different seeds need different things, need different ways to grow. And then you need to water your seeds. So you need to, and if, if you put... If you don't put enough water on them, they might sprout a little bit and then they die. But here's the thing is if you put too much water on them, you drown them and they die. You know, in the Midwest, you just put seeds in the ground and they grow. <laughs> it's like we have to work really hard. But that's really the way our, our lives are, is that we... Our lives often aren't like Midwest soil. They're like Arizona soil. They're hard. And we often, because of our stories, because of the things that have happened to us, we don't know the things that we are good at. We don't know the ways that we can serve others. And there's lots of different ways that we can serve others. So you don't have to be the person that jumps out of their car and helps push someone else's car. You don't have to be the person who jumps in the car and comes over here and helps rip up carpet, which Vince did. Thank you, Vince. I called Vince and he came over. Sometimes you just need to call the plumber and make sure someone's coming to help. So cultivating a, a heart of service is, is figuring out the ways that you serve. If you don't know the ways that you serve, I'm going to ask you to do the really, really scary thing going to someone who's close to you or someone you know and saying, what are the ways, how do you see me serve other people? And if someone comes to you and asks you that and you don't know, don't just say, I don't know. Begin a conversation. Begin to, to work the soil and, and consider the ways that you can serve the people around you. And then, if we jump back a few verses to verse 32, Jesus says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. This is where he says, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our lives are changed because of Jesus. There is grace for us because of Jesus. The things that we're talking about today are not, they're not geared towards telling you that to, to be in relationship with Jesus, you have to get this right and this right and this right. You don't, it, to have grace and mercy, to have relationship with Jesus, you are not, it's not about going out and doing all the right things 
and serving all the people and making sure that everything is okay so that when God comes, your treasure will be in heaven. But in relationship with Jesus, there is a way that we are invited to respond. And the way that we are invited to respond is by acknowledging that that we don't get to choose our neighbor, that we don't get to choose the people who help us, and we don't get to choose the people who we help. That Jesus has invited us and put people in our lives for us to serve. And so be ready to serve. Work on, on removing the barriers in your life. Cultivate a heart of service. Begin to think about the ways that you can care for others. And then there's this. Where are you investing your time? What are you meditating on? What are you thinking about? Where are you spending your money? Our treasure is in relationship with Jesus. But we are distracted people. We have lots of things that we want to do. And we have lots of things that keep us from serving each other because I don't have enough time. I'm not thinking about the people around me who need me to care for them. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. Doing these things, re- removing the barriers, is investing in removing the barriers, cultivating a heart of service, is, is actually asking the question, where is your treasure? Your treasure, your hope, is in Jesus. And that's in, in First Peter, the other, be ready. He says, be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, but do so with gentleness and respect. Our, our hope and our treasure is in Jesus. So what are we investing in? Are you investing your time in caring for the people around you? Are you investing your time in thinking about the ways that you can serve? Are you investing your time in working on the barriers, on the anxiety? Three, four years ago, I would have sat looking at my phone and just basically frozen because I had no idea who to call or what to do to get a plumber to come to the village. And a big part of my conversations with Eric, a big part of my relationship with my wife, has been understanding that anxiety, understanding what happens when I experience that, and being able to hold it, admit it, talk about it, feel it, and then do the thing that I need to do to serve Eric. The words of Jesus disrupt us. The things that I am inviting you to are the things that Jesus has invited me to this week to consider and, and even has, has created space this week for me to do them. Thank you, Eric, for calling me. They should disrupt your life. We don't just get to do all the things that we want to do all the time. Being in relationship with Jesus is going to disrupt your life. It's going to change the ways that you live. It's going to change your relationships. It's going to change the way you view the people around you, the way you care for them. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. I have a few minutes if you have any thoughts or questions or pushbacks, and then we will pray and sing.
for? We can just pray right now. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll put it out there. <laughs> so, having dealt with this anxiety, because I have it too, I, I used to hate people. Like, with, with my friends would be like, let's get a pizza. And I'd be like, uh, anybody but me. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not going to call. Luckily, you can do it online now. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> What, like, what would you suggest for, like, just practically dealing with anxiety? You know, even if, even, even if, you know, we can't, if we can't get counseling or if we don't have time, because obviously that's the ideal way to do it, like, what would you suggest having dealt with your own anxiety? I think the biggest thing that's happened in, in talking, in understanding and dealing with my anxiety has been knowing that it's there and actually like taking a moment and, and feeling it and saying like, this is something that that's there. I understand it. Um, and that's happened through a lot of conversation. Um, that's happened through a lot of relationship and a lot of, I mean, it, my, it's understanding that, that my anxiety has wounded, you know, in particular has wounded my wife. And that that's been a big part of our relationship. Um, and having that, like being willing to have that impact me uh, has been a big thing and a hard thing. And that's, it's not, dealing with anxiety is not, it's never going to be easy. Yeah. So could you, kind of further your answer to her about just how Jesus interacts with that from because I think like the treasure part where your treasure is seems like you were alluding to that but you didn't say that directly yeah my treasure is in the when I am dealing with my anxiety the thing that I have to confront is that my treasure is in myself and my own fears in the, in in the things that when I call the the plumber, I'm afraid of not knowing what I'm going to say, not knowing what I'm asking. That they're going to ask me a question that, and he did. He asked me uh, what email to use, and I was like, should I give them Eric's email? Should I give them my email? I'll give them the church's email. So I gave him church's email. But it was like this, it's this, these things of like, what happens when that, when those questions come, like, it, it, I'm afraid of myself being exposed, and that, that treasure rests in me, and that for me to move past that, and to be able to actually do the thing I, I need to do, I have to acknowledge that Jesus has invited me to serve. Um, and that my treasure is in that and in, in relationship with him. Uh, that, yeah. Mike, can someone run the mic for me? Thanks. <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> my anxieties have always lay in in the place where if I have to ask questions or if I have to ask for help that the other person, whether it be you or Eric or my wife or my father, <laughs> that the, you would see that I was inadequate and that I didn't have what it takes. And, and when you were talking in the beginning and talking about how Jesus' words to the Pharisees should disrupt us, they used to really disrupt me. As a young Christian, and even as a Christian coming to the village, I remember just like thinking of all the ways that I don't measure up and how I'm not adequate. But when I hear you talk and you quote the words of Jesus to the Pharisees of the day, I realize that he's not addressing me 
in those verses, he is speaking on my behalf. And, and I would like to invite that maybe in some ways he's speaking on your behalf too. He's liberating you. He's setting you free. Not for freedom of just doing whatever you want to, but freedom to be from out of under the thumb of the oppressors of this world, of the systems that are set in, um, so that you can live freely to to give just out of the sure the sheer pleasure of being able to give. I agree and I disagree. I think what you said is beautiful and it's good to remember that we are set free. But I think the words of the Pharisees are for us. And I think when he says you clean the outside and you do not in that inside you are full of greed that's us. And it's not, the cleaning the inside is not a requirement. It's not a, a, it's not a bar that we have to pass. It's something that we are invited into and something that's true about us, that we are consumed by ourselves. We're consumed by our own greed and that actually most of our anxiety comes from the fear that we will not measure up or be found out or be found out and be exposed and so the invitation yes is to freedom but we also have to come to terms with the fact that we are inside we are broken and we are filled with greed and that beginning to clean that is is working on our anxiety is working on our relationship with christ and is Stepping into serving others, um, but I yeah, it's a good. It's it uh, the the freedom is good to remember yeah. that there is freedom. That 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 what is true is that we have a relationship with Jesus because of what He did, not because of what we do. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that those words are not for us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Peter, and then we gotta be done. So uh, I, it's coming from the perspective of somebody that doesn't – I have plenty of issues. I'm not trying to say I'm perfect, but I don't really have an issue with anxiety. So how, uh, as somebody that doesn't have an issue, how can somebody like me help people that do, and what can we do to just help people work through that anxiety? Yeah, I mean, it becomes a way that we serve each other, and it's, it isn't engaging and having compassion on each other. Um, I mean, the way that you, it's a really good question. Um, the way that my wife has engaged me is by actually being willing to address it and to ha- have a conversation about it. And not in, not in a condemning me and saying, why didn't you call so-and-so or why didn't you do this thing, but actually in, in addressing me and seeing me and saying, what is it? What's, what, what are you afraid of? What are you encountering? What's happening there as you, as you approach the moment of, of calling someone? What's happening in your walk? And it is, it is in having compassion in those moments and being willing to have a conversation about it. Um, often we write people off. And we say that, uh, like, I know that Mark has anxiety about calling people, so I'm not going to ask him to call people for me. I'm not going to talk to him about that. And I think that's the wrong response. But it is about having compassion and understanding that that's the thing that's hard. Um, and here's the thing. is is We've talked a lot about anxiety, and that's a very big thing in service that keeps us from helping the people around us. But I also want to talk, I want you to hear that there are very practical things that we have in our lives that keep us from serving. Like my Birkenstocks. Like they, that is a very real thing in our lives, that we actually create barriers so that we are hard to get, in, are hard to get a hold of, that we have busy schedules and we don't have space. Like there are very practical things that keep us from serving that we need to address in our lives. Even if you're not, like, 
even if you're dealing with anxiety and you're not dealing with anxiety, like there are still things that we need to address in our lives that keep us from serving. But, yeah, thank you for your question. That's good. All right. Okay, really quick. <laughs> I think the other thing that kept coming into my mind is I'm like, what are my barriers? And I realized my barriers are really my own demands. Um, And so I wanted to throw that out there as like another thing to consider um, because really, like even my demand that Mark not have anxiety, go get my thing done. So, um, or that my time is my own, like I think is one of my biggest demands. Like when I'm X, Y, Z, if I have someone so plant, it's like my time, it shouldn't be interrupted. And I shouldn't have to go help anybody, Jesus. Like that's, and that's not how Jesus works. So I feel like that's what's coming to mind for me, but I wanted to throw it out there, like to consider what are the things you're like, oh no, that's not a negotiable. That's just how it is. And that's probably what Jesus might be poking at. Thank you. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to engage with the things that you said when you were here. Um, I pray that you would be working in us, uh, that you would uh, invite us into the scary place of having to serve people this week. Um, Just as, as I was meditating on this and you created space for me to do that this week, I pray that you would Uh, Do that for each of us as we move forward from this place. Show us the ways, um, the barriers that keep us from serving. And um, also as we consider how we can serve, that you would reveal to us the ways that we serve the people around us. I thank you for this community. I pray that you would bless our worship. And bless our conversation. Give us grace and compassion for each other. In your name I pray. Amen.